classifier does the um, classification. So that sample here is actually very useful for teaching. If I had more time, I would go a bit deeper into this one now. But that's a bit of a homework for you, right? So you have the link, uh, which is in the lecture slides. You can look into the linear classifier, or if you don't want to use this link, just search for linear classifier demo, and you can see how it's working. Yeah? Uh, what exactly do those negative numbers and negative? Where are negative numbers? Uh, like minus 1.9. Yeah. Uh, I think what to yeah, also. These. Yeah. This one also. These are all weights, right? So you can either say a pixel has a positive impact or a negative impact on my result. So you can say, I, if you go back to our image here, you can say, hey, for the horse, it's important that that one has this specific color. But you can also say uh, it should be the opposite more. It should be going into the negative direction. It makes ex uh, more sense if you have multiple um, multiple dimensions as well. So that you then say, uh, if that pixel is yellow, I would ne negatively uh, give it a negative reward for this classification because it has to be the opposite. You could mathematically transform everything that you only have positive weights and you define the classes positively, but I will not go into the mathematical details here. Okay. Next important thing is loss functions. Uh, loss functions are finally how do we evaluate how good our system is. And there are many possibilities. One of the intuitively understandable one, and I spoke today morning about visualization as, uh, which makes us helpful to understand things intuitively. So, you have uh, like a correct class um, which your, your network should recognize, and VS, VM loss, that's a bit our, our function here. If our, right, that would be the, the score for the correct class. Now, our network or linear classifier outputs a score which is higher than that. Cool. If it's higher than that, uh, we can say, well done network, you have correctly classified the thing. Nothing to be done. Or, it is lower than our threshold, then it's not so nice. Should have been on the other side. Um, and actually, uh, one can even say it should be in a, in a margin around the optimal value or the special value. And if it is larger than that margin, we are fine. If it's lower than the margin, we, we are a bit problematic. And you define the margin with SJ. And as long as SJ minus the one reported by the classifier is... Uh, Smaller than zero, then we are fine. And if it's, I oh know, as long as it's, sorry, sorry. Yeah, as long as this difference is smaller than zero, we will give it a zero. There is no loss, we are fine. There's no error, everything is okay. But as soon as this difference gets bigger than zero, uh, and uh, so as soon as that value here, sorry, as soon as it gets very small, I'm, I'm mixing up things. Let me say again. We take the maximum of zero or SJ minus SY. SJ is our threshold we are setting, and SY is the reported score of the classifier. This is threshold minus the score becomes very negative. So if it gets here in that direction, we are totally wrong with our classification. Then we say, hey, you did it wrong, it's an error. And like that, we can define a loss. We can also define the loss in other ways, but this SVM loss, also known as hint loss, is one of the typical losses. There's actually a whole block about many loss functions and when to use which one and why are some useful and some not. I will not go so much into the details, but we should understand there is not only one loss. There are many loss functions, and that's, again, something to validate on a... Uh, on a validation set. We shouldn't just always say we take the SVM loss or the cross entropy as errors. There are many other ways as well. Um, 
and that's not all of it. We have the loss, the error our network is making, and then just a small question. When is the loss minimum? Any ideas? Some people are raising their hand. Yeah? When the uh, loss is minimum, when the classification, you can say that one is the prediction and one is the label, when the prediction is close to label, then there will be minimum loss. Yeah. So always when, when the correct prediction is made, always when, when our reported output is, is uh, big enough, then we are minimum. We have a loss of zero. Um, and the second part which comes into play into our error function is the regularization. Uh, who heard already about regularization? Okay, it's always the same people I realize. Very good. <laughs> Um, the regularization could be, for example, the, the weight matrix which we have, the square of that weight matrix, um, and we want to get that small as well. So we just add it to our loss which we have. We add, for example, the square of all the weights. Why do we do that? Um, we do it because, uh, I mean, it would be minimum if the weights are zero. Putting all weights zero doesn't make much sense. Our classifier wouldn't classify anything. But trying to get them small is typically a good idea. Then it doesn't go too much into uh, classifying um, just one class with a very high weight or whatsoever. Um, and these advantages make it very useful to use regularization. And again, there are many researchers and some of the papers of my PhD students currently are published because they are looking into regularization techniques back from the 1980s where there was a lot of theory and not just engineering and trying out things and uh, seeing something works and they find out that there had been really very well elaborated uh, thoughts about regularization techniques as well. So there's more than dropout and just uh, squared sum, there are many other regularization techniques available. And the last thing which we need for training our neural network is a gradient descent. And I will not go much into this detail, um, but one thing I want to say, I mean, you, you calculate the delta of your weights based on how much your loss would go down. That's more or less the idea of grade, gradient descent. And typically on graphic cards, here, that's a Python implementation, by the way, uh, on graphic cards. Um, so, yes, no, it's, I think, JavaScript. Yeah. Um, that um, that, uh, that you have batches nowadays. So you do not take just one uh, sample image for training, but you say here, uh, 200, um, you, you take, for example, 256 randomly generated examples or examples from your data set. Okay, these are like the, the basics, loss function, batch function, and gradient descent, yeah? Batch size is a meta-parameter, right? That's a meta-parameter. So how, how do we choose it? Based how do you choose the batch size? A very good question. Um, uh, there is no standard answer in that one. Often you take a multiple of two, uh, I mean a power of two, and it depends somehow on the graphics cards you are using. So uh, typically actually it's written some, somehow either in, uh, you see it in the toolkit you are using and the graphic card you have, what batch size might be useful. So um, 256 is, uh, six is a safe guess if you don't know what to do. Um, 32 is also quite common, so a rather small batch size. Um, the bigger it gets, uh, the more likely it would be that you might end up in some global minima, uh, in some local minima during training. Um, the smaller it gets, you are maybe, yeah, it, you you might be not too efficient in things. Um, and on the other hand, uh, your error, your loss, how to say, your weights might change dramatically every time. There is no golden answer to that. I'm sorry. I don't know, you have other experiences? Yeah, okay. Cool. Um, next is convolutions. We, we saw actually very nicely how Adrian today said that during his 
master's or PhD, you were manually defining some filters. That's for the same before. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, like that filter here, saying there is some very big number and all around very small numbers. That is a very typical filter which was manually defined in the past to see very uh, interesting points which are having a big, uh, typically counters, you want to have sharp edges you want to detect in your image. And that is a convolution filter which was typically applied in image processing in the past. Input image, applying the filter, running it over all the image pixel by pixel, and at the end, seeing that. But most of us don't really know how do I compute actually the con uh, convolution? And again, I urge you, I will not go into all of these details now, but there are some very nice blog entries written by some of my students uh, for our lecture. Um, one is, what are convolutions? It refers again to some existing online videos and uh, demos. Um, but what it shows here is a very nice function. So convolutions are not always two-dimensional. That's the first mistake people make. Um, actually, they are three-dimensional images in most cases, but you can also make them one-dimensional. So you have your, let's say we have a blue function here, and we have a convolution kernel which is going over this function in this way. And as soon as there is a bit of an overlap, our convolution has this value, and then it rises until we have a perfect overlap, and then it goes down again. So that's how the convolution works in a one-dimensional way. And on a, on a different function, you will have then different shapes of, of the convolution filter. You can see here, for example, how it looks like. And you see a bit the mask behind. But another thing was quite useful as well. <clears throat> there is an example, which you can again do as a homework. You have the, um, an input matrix. You have your kernel. First thing what you do in CNN is you flip the kernel twice. So you do a, a horizontal and a vertical shift. Why? Why do we flip the kernel twice? Anyone knows the answer? Why don't we just multiply these images and apply a correlation? Sorry? Is there a duality you mean? It's the same? Or what do you want to say? Um, it is not transposing, by the way. Transposing would be uh, um, uh, just shifting X and Y. It is flipping and flipping like this as well. Yeah? Just a shot in the dark, but maybe it's not generating random values. No, no, no. Uh, actually, I can tell you one thing. In most machine learning toolkits which you are using, there is no convolution done. There is only correlation done. Most of the implementations don't do it right. They call these things convolutional neural networks, and theoretical persons in computer vision and um, neural networks hate these guys. But in engineering, it just works, because if you train the neural network, the neural network doesn't learn to flip-flip. It is the same for the neural network, to flip-flip or to directly train a correlation filter. doesn't need to be done at all. Why do we do convolution? Because a convolution is associative and cumulative. So we have a possibility to change the order of our matrices or to pre-compute the convolution of two or three kernels which are applied in a row um, in order to make it faster on hardware. That's something, if we once train a neural network and we want to translate it to FPGA, that thing becomes handy if we did the convolution and not the correlation. But that is practically not so much of a use and most of the toolkits just use a correlation. So if you want to be correct, you should say CNN stands for correlation neural networks and not for convolution in neural networks. Uh, just a bit of an insight, right? Um, that's by the way, I think one of the mistakes Kapasi does in his lecture. Um, but here you see uh, 
a good explanation about convolution, how it works and so on. I will not go through the details. And in the next link, you see also how they are used in neural networks with example code in Python. Um, and what that actually means to have a valid, a same and a full convolution. Maybe you heard that in my MATLAB or in several toolkits you can say valid, full, same. Theoretically nothing else than a valid convolution exists, which is having an input matrix, multiplying it, convolving it with a kernel and resulting in something which is smaller because you cannot overlap, you know, the first application on a 3 to 3 kernel could be here and then here and then here and then here. There is no other valid way, so our result would be a 2 times 2 matrix. So, um, what people introduced was a zero padding. And it seems to be standard. I've been asked today morning, what do I do in order after the rotation, what I do apply on the images? Doing zeros is just because it works. There is no theoretical foundation that it's really helpful. Actually, it has been even shown for some tasks to be damaging. Uh, so one can be careful, uh, should be a bit careful by always taking standard. And I really not suggest you at all to do a full convolution. That thing, you, know, you more or less just pre pre uh, calculate the, the value here just based on one individual element in your original matrix. That's not so useful at all. Okay. Um, so that is for understanding convolutions. The next part in the deep neural network is max pooling. So you have your image and you apply a filter and that filter uh, just takes the maximum out of it. Why do we need that? Why do we know max pooling? What's the intuition behind max pooling? Sorry? For downsampling. Downsampling, reducing the size. That's enough. Hey, come on, I can downsample the data in many other ways as well. Why is that one? The best feature, we get the best tool. The, the best, yeah, the best, this is a good thing. You, you remember the image of Adrian, right? He showed there was the highest intensity for the spore, the, the teeth part, at that one spot. And typically, in many tasks, we are only interested in that there is something, not exactly where it is. And we only need the best matching one. That's totally fine for us. And that makes it actually a bit invariant to a small rotation and shifts and so on. However, it also introduces problems for tasks like signature verification, where maybe the exact position would be more important than just a relative one. So there is actually, again, some work of people uh, showing that uh, pooling should be actually omitted in the future. There are better ways for that. Uh, Hinton is doing a lot of research on that, by the way. Nonetheless, currently it's standard, and that's why more or less the standard architecture has our image, and some convolution and pooling, then it does a flattening. That just means we have our image, and we make one large vector out of that. It, it's mathematically nothing happening. We can actually directly output our 3 times 3 kernel with uh, 250 channels. We can compute it directly to a classification layer. However, in the implementation on many graphic cards, you have to make a vector out of that. That's why you have a flattening. And then you have various fully connected layers. And finally, after softmax, you have your loss function, and then you can train that thing from beginning to uh, end. That's a theory. I, I hope you are somehow with me. If you have some questions, please just raise your hand. If not, we go more to the praxis now, right? Digit recognition with this, um, with this uh, CNN. Uh, let me see. Yeah. I will take maybe that one first. Yeah. So, again, I'm zooming in. That demo is not from me, it's again from Kapasi. So, Kapasi is a very cool guy. He, he is still, or he just finished recently his PhD thesis. Um, but during his PhD thesis, he was making many helpful online tutorials, and he is a nerd in terms of uh, JavaScript implementation. And 
luckily I got a, a now uh, uh, 4G uh, uh, internet connection of suite, I don't know, uh, a fast one, which made it possible for me to show one of the live demos from Capacity. Anyone saw this already? Yeah. Oh, not so many here. So it's very useful. You can play around. Um, uh, what? I will not go too much into details. MNIST data set. We have 10,000 images. For example, uh, they are cropped to 28 times 28 pixels. So we have a quite small neural network. And what you can define here is actually the neural network. You say, our input layer Um, comes in, the size is 24 times, uh, 28 times 28, and the output will be 24 times 24, because um, it wants to do a 5 times 5, oh sorry, the input is 24 times 24, and then it does a 5 times 5 uh, convolution, 8 filters, meaning 8 uh, kernels, uh, uh, the depth of our tensor will be 8. A stride of 1, meaning really at every position. Um, a padding of 2 means we add 2 rows and columns of zeros around the image so that we will not uh, remove, uh, not reduce the size. And then the activation function as well. And then here you see it does a pooling, another convolution, another pooling and then a softmax. That's how here in JavaScript the architecture is, um, is defined. And with that architecture, you can change the network if you want, but I don't do that. You can do a, a classification on the MNIST data set. And um, at the end, actually I will run a classification further. You see the error is uh, actually getting rather low. Yeah, let me I will refresh the page because we are... Right, so it starts high, gets down, gets further down, and after many iterations the error goes lower and lower uh, into a more useful trained neural network. So that's a real example now how a real convolution in your network on images directly our 24 times 24 images is applied uh, and then what's the nice thing now is we can look into our visualization so you see that would be the input and that's the gradient of the input so what comes back from the back propagation what has to be changed then what does our first convolution filter do here you see a visualization of the weights and you see some of them are useful already you have this black-white transition, you have here this corner as being white, and some of them look still a bit like random noise. So here we can see inside that our neural network didn't train much yet. Uh, I will let it continue training. And we might see that, the, that these weights, they shift now. You see some diagonal weights after a while, and they get more and more human readable more or less. That shows us the neural network is actually learning. Of course we have always a different activation and activation gradient here, but the weights um, become more and more stable. And then we go on in the further layers. The visualization of the weights doesn't make sense so much, but I will have a video about that in a moment as well. And you can go deeper into more and more uh, convolutions. And now, unfortunately, we do not see our input sample, but you see that here, you will always see already, like in the second last layer, before the softmax, we see a very good positive sample and several a bit more negative examples here. And after the softmax, you have your final classification result. Um, so that online demo lets you really try out by yourself what's happening. You can change the neural network a bit and you, you can see how they are working. Um, the same we can do on image, on CFAR, which is a smaller version of ImageNet, where you have also many classes inside and you want to recognize, for example, birds. And in a train neural network, you can again see on our example image, 
what does the first filter do? To the images, it detects some important regions, also colors, by the way. And you see the weights. And here the weights look also into the color information. Again, you see this typical shape of diagonal or vertical horizontal lines. And uh, you see what's happening inside the network. You can go into more and more deeper layers and some of the sample accuracies of the images, what, what the network would output. So, so these online examples can make, make it more graspable what's happening in neural networks. Any questions so far? And you can actually more deeply understand the stuff if you go to uh, the, the, the playground on TensorFlow, right? Playground.tensorflow.org. So when I ask my PhD students what you're doing and they say I'm playing, then I don't know if they mean online games or if they're playing around on the Google Playground. But actually that should be research, it should be fun. It should be something which you really want to do and we play around until we understand more and more. And what, what's very nice in this one, you can select, for example, a predefined data set. You can select some manually, some filters which you think are in interesting. And then you can say, ah, oh, you want to use two hidden layers, one with four neurons, one with two neurons. And then you let the thing run, and it shows you how the separation would look like in reality. So, you can run that thing, and now we see how it learns, and finally learns the correct class distribution. And then we say, aha, but neural network, would you also be able to do it with only one hidden layer? Um, I don't know, is it running? No, let's run it again. Yeah, one hidden layer is also enough. What do you think if I remove that one? Just zero hidden layers? Will it learn or not? No, very good guess. Um, let's try it with only one neuron in the hidden layer. So it is trying, it is trying, but one neuron isn't enough. Two neurons? Yeah, some of you have already a bit of good experience, right? With two neurons, mathematically, we will be able to get something close to working, but you will not get out of that uh, more or less para parabolic shape there. So we have to add another one in order to finally get our circle running. So we have like an overlay of two of these uh, um, quadratic functions and then we have something which actually works already with an accuracy of 100%. So that playground is really something you should let your grad students play with. They should, they should learn to understand what's happening inside the neural networks. And the next video, anyone use who, you, who, need, who knows DeepVis? DeepVis, oh really little. Right, we learned already today about adversarial neural networks. There is something which is called uh, um, deconvolution and so on. There is a lot of theory, I will not go into that. I will just show you a video <clears throat> in order to get my voice back. So we let uh, another guy do the job. Oh, that's a bit risky now. I should have preloaded that video. Recent advances in neural networks have enabled computers to better see and understand the world. They can recognize school buses and zebras, and can tell the difference between Maltese Terriers and Yorkshire Terriers. We now know what it takes to train these neural networks well, but we don't know so much about how they're actually computing their final answers. We developed this interactive deep visualization toolbox to shine light into these black boxes, showing what happens inside of neural nets. In the top left corner, we show the input to the network, which can be a still image or a video from a webcam. These black squares in the middle show the activations on a single layer of a network, in this case the popular deep neural network called AlexNet running in CAFE. By interacting with the network, we can see what some of the neurons are doing. For example, on this first layer, a unit in the center responds strongly to light to dark edges. Its neighbor, one neuron over, responds to edges in the opposite direction, dark to light. Using optimization, 
We can synthetically produce images that line up each neuron on this layer to see what each neuron is looking for. We can scroll through every layer in the network to see what it does, including convolution, pooling, and normalization layers. We can switch back and forth between showing the actual activations and showing images synthesized to produce high activation. By the time we get to the fifth convolutional layer, the features being computed represent abstract concepts. For example, this neuron seems to respond to faces. We can further investigate this neuron by showing a few different types of information. First, we can artificially create optimized images using new regularization techniques that are described in our paper. These synthetic images show that this neuron fires in response to a face and shoulders. We can also plot the images from the training set that activate this neuron the most, as well as pixels from those images most responsible for the high activations, computed via the deconvolution technique. This feature responds to multiple faces in different locations. And by looking at the decon, we can see that it would respond more strongly if we had even darker eyes and rosier lips. We can also confirm that it cares about the head and shoulders, but ignores the arms and torso. We can even see that it fires to some extent for cat faces. Using backprop or decon, we can see that this unit depends most strongly on a couple units in the previous layer con 4 and on about a dozen or so in CON3. Now let's look at another neuron on this layer. So what's this unit doing? From the top nine images, we might conclude that it fires for different types of clothing. But examining stop. the synthetic images shows that it may be detecting not clothing I will stop this guy now. You can watch that video later on. Um, but I think it's a quite nice um, way, right, I put the link there as well, it's a nice way to understand more what's happening inside, and that toolbox is also available freely for download. Uh, yeah, how do we continue? Not much, right? <laughs> Just five minutes left. I will not uh, go into any of these things here more, but I will tell you where you will find the information for further reading. So, um, I have put online in the same lecture, in the same Google slides, I have put a lecture I was giving in 2016 where I introduced BLSTM and how they are working for handwriting recognition that might be quite useful for some of you to look into. Um, just following here, there are some slides with PyTorch and PyCharm. Anyone is using PyCharm? No. Do you get the license free from here? Yes. Yeah. No. Definitely use the chance as a student. You can get it for free. Install PyCharm, actually uh, install anything from JetBrains, they have very cool tools uh, to, to generate websites and other things. Uh, PyCharm is very useful, what you can do, you can program locally on your computer, you can connect via SSH to a GPU cluster, and externally run the code on the GPU cluster, but it looks like you are even debugging it locally on your computer, so all of this uh, connection stuff and so on is done by PyCharm directly. Uh, how this is done, there is an Anaconda installation you need to put on the GPU and so on. It's de described a bit in these uh, slides here. I will not go into the details of, of that one. But it's really useful uh, to use. Um, and then you can, yeah, remotely program and work with it. Uh, before it comes to the things, some other um, useful uh, online demos, SegNet, uh, image, uh, image segmentation network, right? Deep convolution in your network, able to segment cars and trees and other things, right? So you can just take one of the sample images here and you can run it and you see how it outputs and it says oh, there are many uh, persons, some trees are there, you see the classes below, it's a bit small, you can zoom in a little bit. Um, so you see a bit how it works. 